So this morning, we're entering into the Ten Commandments as we go through Exodus, God's law. And I recently discovered, and I found it fascinating, I think maybe you'll find it fascinating too, but back in 2014, um, a group of atheists got together, right? Atheists, so people that say there is no God, um, got together and came up with their own Ten Commandments. I found this very interesting, right? Where after they had 2,800, 2,800 submissions from 18 countries and 27 U.S. states, and then a team of 13 judges selected 10 of the more sober and serious submissions. And they, they called it, this is cute, they called it the 10 non-commandments. So right off the bat, I think you're a little confused that, uh, you know, like, are, are these things we should do or shouldn't do? Um, so anyways, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to show you what they were real quick. I'm not going to point out everything that's wrong with them. There's a lot of things that are wrong uh, logically throughout this whole list. But I did want to point out um, one specific one. And so here they are, you know, real quick. And I know this is uh, small print, but uh, it starts off. Be open-minded and be willing to alter your beliefs with new evidence. Strive to understand what is most likely to be true, not to believe what you wish to be true. Uh, three, the scientific method is the most reliable way of understanding the natural world. Uh, their non-commandment four, every person has the right to control their body. Number five, of course, atheists, right? So God is, is, is not necessary to be a good person or to live a full and meaningful life. Number six, be mindful of the consequences of all your actions and recognize that you must take responsibility for them. Number seven, treat others as you would want them to treat you and can reasonably expect them to want to be treated. Think about their perspective. Number eight, we have the responsibility to consider others, including future generations. And then you get to nine. (laughs) And it's, there is no one right way to live. It's like, okay, you just destroyed everything in this list. Like, this is really confusing. If the name wasn't confusing, the 10 non-commandments, this is super confusing, right? So if there's no one right way to live, why should I live out any of these things, right? I mean, why even go on to 10? Like, it, it doesn't matter, right? There's no one right way to live. So not, that's, I mean, that's a problem in and of itself, but The last time I spoke, I I spoke about um, self-defeating statements, right? Um, This is a self-defeating statement because because if if you're saying that this statement is true, that that there is no one right way to live, um, so you're saying, is is that the only way to live, that that there is no one right way to live? It's confusing. It's self-defeating. It doesn't make any sense. And also, without a transcendent moral lawgiver, right? An absolute truth, um, a standard to look up to, which is God in his very nature. Without that, out, a moral law outside of ourselves, without that, what you say is right and wrong just becomes personal opinion. It's just your personal opinion. Why? Why should I follow this list at all? Why? There's no justification for it. Right? Atheists can't come up with any sort of justification on why we should or shouldn't do these things. It has no bearing on anyone. But this morning, we are going to begin to break into uh, the Ten Commandments. God's moral law. This is, this, God's moral law has an important bearing on everyone, and it's not just personal opinion. So the Ten Commandments, which are, it's a reflection of who God is, right? It's a reflection of his very nature. So this morning I'm going to be talking about the first four of the Ten Commandments. Um, And I think, Steve, you have, you're doing the next six next Sunday? Just number five. Wait, so I got to go through four and you only got to go through one? Okay, all right. 
All right, but also, I also want to go through an overview, a, a short overview of its purpose and how we as Christians should approach it. And I'm going to be honest with you. Once I started into this study, I, I opened up within myself a can of theological worms that um, I couldn't stop. And I mean, because when you start talking about the old covenant, you got to think about the new covenant and what's in the new covenant and how they're similar and how they're, how they're different. And you just have to then just read the whole New Testament. I mean, like, Chris, I had papers all over and I was scribbling on notes and I ran out of paper, so I started writing on the wall and, and I had sticky notes on the wall and I was stringing string across you know, the room and making, okay, well, this connects to that and that connects to this. And I went crazy. You have to, I mean, you have to, to understand it. It's like you have to understand Jesus under, ushering in the new covenant through his life, ministry, death, resurrection. So you got to go through the gospels. Again, understanding the difference between the two covenants, what's changed. I, I mean, so I would recommend, honestly, as we go through Exodus, because after the Ten Commandments, you get more of God's law for the people of Israel through the end of Exodus into Leviticus, uh, through Deuteronomy. As we go through that, I would really recommend um, reading parts of Acts, uh, reading Romans. Uh, Paul, man, uh, great theology throughout Paul's letters Romans specifically, maybe like six chapters, six through ten, seven through ten, somewhere in there. Uh, Galatians is a good one, and Hebrews, excellent, mm, very good. Uh, it's hard to stop, uh, and it's very exciting. Uh, so, what I want to do is quick go through a little bit of context of what's going on here. Israel, right, or Jacob's family, they, they enter Egypt with 70 people. It's a family, 70, 70 of them. The Israelites enter Egypt. They were eventually enslaved. They were treated harshly by the Egyptians. They were actually dependent upon Egyptian culture, their Egyptian civil law, Egyptian moral law. They were indoctrinated to Egyptian religion and their gods. Right? And after 430 years, they were delivered out of bondage from Egypt by the hand of God, saved by God, redeemed by God, with not 70, right? not a family, but I think it says like 600,000 men. And that's just the men. So add the women and children on top of that. What you have is a nation, not a family anymore, but a nation, a big people group. And remember this as we go through the Ten Commandments and beyond into God's law. God makes a covenant with Israel. He's making a covenant. And so it, it's a conditional covenant. Conditional in the way that there are terms to it, right? If, if they keep God's commandments... They will be his treasured people among all people, right? A light to the nations around them. They are to reveal God to the world through their nation, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And just to understand this a little bit more, it's kind of like a covenant, right? Um, it's kind of like when we do marriage ceremonies, right? It's not, we don't call it a contract. Um, we call that a covenant, when we do marriage ceremonies. And I know there are some similarities between the two, a contract and a covenant, but a contract, typically you're going behind closed doors and between a couple parties and you're signing a contract where no one knows the details except for the parties that are involved, right? But a covenant, it's public, it's spiritual, it's binding in the sense that God will for sure fulfill it, even though the other party might not, and there's accountability. So Israel is marrying itself to God who is holy and righteous and perfect, and I don't, they don't have any idea what they're in for.
the Ten Commandments, the first four, the Ten Commandments are the principle, the principal commands that God gives to Israel. And, and they're written in stone, just those, the ten, those are the ones that are written in stone by the finger of God, like as if like these aren't going anywhere, right? The Ten Commandments. And, and Matt Chandler, and I'll have to thank Steve for pointing me to this, um, but Matt Chandler gives a good analogy that I think helps us in our culture, in our day and age, relate to the Ten Commandments. It's like, it's really like our U.S. Constitution, Okay, we have the U.S. Constitution. That's our nation's principal law, right? And then from that, we flow s- several federal laws, right? Several. So out of the Constitution flow from the heart of the Constitution federal laws. And you know, these federal laws go back through the court system over and over again because they're constantly compared to right? They're fought in court. They're compared back to the Constitution to see if it really does align or not, right? So like that, the Ten Commandments um, uh, is God's principal commandments, and everything after that flows from the heart of those Ten Commandments. Just a way to connect to it through our culture, the Ten Commandments, it's called that in our Bibles, right? But in Hebrew, have you ever heard it called the Ten Words? Right? That's how it's actually translated in Hebrew, right? The Ten Words. But to make, it a little, make a little more sense in English, we call it the Ten Commandments. So when God speaks these commandments, it's interesting that it's, it's audible to everyone. That's how it's supposed to be taken, to the whole nation of Israel. Everyone can hear this, where, whereas typically... Um, Moses is the messenger, right? He's typically running up and down. He's going up and down the mountain, relaying information back and forth. This, God's speaking to everyone and everyone hears it, okay? It's audible to everyone. No one can miss this. So Exodus 20, starting at verse one, open your Bibles. I'm not gonna have the scripture up here. So Open your Bibles, Exodus 20, verse 1, says this, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Let me read that again. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This this is an extremely important, important verse. Okay, Don't miss this verse. And actually, you know how it's called, what I just said, it's called the, uh, the Ten Words. Some people actually call it, in college, uh, my professors used to call it the Eleven Words. Have you, has anybody ever heard that? The Eleven Words? A few people? The reason being is because this verse is so important. It sets up the context for all the commands that follow it. And some people actually believe that it's so important that we should actually include it in the Ten Commandments. It's that important because it's like, why is Israel as a nation, why should they follow God? And God's like, I'm the Lord. I'm the one that saved you. I'm the one that redeemed you. I'm the one that freed you from bondage from the Egyptians. And I'm the one who loved you before you loved me. And so just like that, as Christians, right, as Christians, we can actually look at it the same way as we look to Christ, right, the one who first loved us, the one who saved us, the one who redeemed us, the one who saved us from the bondage of sin and death. And so as Christians, we look on Christ the same way. And this is why we should desire to follow Christ because of what he's done. So the first commandment, verse three, you shall have no other gods before me or you shall have no other gods besides me. Uh, Reads both ways, no other gods before me, no other gods besides me. This goes, it can go right back to creation. It's like there are no other gods, right? Right back to creation. God's 
it. That's it. He's the one and only God. Therefore, you shall not put any other gods before me, any other gods besides me. And Egypt is coming, sorry, Egypt, Israel is coming out of Egypt, right, with the belief, with a belief system that believed in imaginary false gods. So it's not just, you shouldn't put any other gods besides me. There are none. There aren't any of these false gods. And not only that, they, they, they came out from Egypt, like I said, but with a, a belief where Pharaoh himself was a god. So it's like, no other gods besides me. There are no other gods. I'm it. I created everything. When I created everything, uh, when God created everything, there weren't any other gods helping me. They don't exist. Even if they did exist, God would be the one that created them. And you yourself aren't God. You don't put you yourself besides me or before me. And I, I think a good example of this uh, in today, um, a lot of you probably heard of Mormonism, and I, I'm not trying to offend anybody, I'm just speaking truth here. Uh, Mormonism, and it may surprise you, Mormonism is the most polytheistic religion in the world. I don't know if that surprises anybody. And you're like, well, why? Well, well, let me explain. Poly- polytheistic means a belief in multiple gods, okay? Not just one god, but multiple gods. And here's the reason. In, in Mormonism doctrine and covenants, what they believe is that there are an infinite amount of gods. Infinite amount of gods. Why? Because, because you yourself, if you live up to their doctrine and covenants good enough, you know, if you do the work well enough, if you live up to their laws, even these, including these, but including their own doctrine and covenants well enough, you yourself can become a god. And you yourself can create your own planet, and you can create your own creation. And so they believe that there's an infinite amount of gods. In fact, we just happen to live on this so-called planet with this particular god. So I just thought, when I was reading through this, I thought about that, and I just thought it was a, a good example of what you're not supposed to do. Right? They not only believe that there are other gods besides God, but that you can become one and you, put, you can put yourself on the same level of, as God if you uh, live up to the rules well enough. So God saying, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. The second commandment, Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6 It says, you shall not make for yourself the carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, I'm not going to go through everything in this section. I'm not going to point out every detail. But, you know, this is the no idols, right? The no idols law. To make an image, you have to understand this, to make an image, even if you are making an image to help you worship God, is an offense to God. Because anything created cannot compare to God. It can't. It can't compare to his majesty. It can't compare to his holiness. It can't compare to his purity. It can't compare. So anything that we make with our human hands, offensive. And, and, and right away, I thought, I thought Mennonites, you know? Actually, I think, I think we really got something right here. Um, 
Mennonites took this really seriously. I mean, have you seen our churches, right? Uh, you, find, you find very little art in them, you know, like no statues. The architecture is, is just regular and kind of plain. And if we have anything, it's like, you know, a cross, maybe a dove or something like that. You won't see, what else won't you see? You won't see flags at the front of our churches or schools, right? The issue, I mean, the main concern was this, right? That we, not, we, we worship God alone, right? We commit ourselves to God alone. The concern was idol worship. And I think we also got something else right, right? In the confession of faith, we didn't make it legalistic. We actually got to the heart of the law. We got to the heart of the law, which, you know, in here it doesn't say, anywhere in here, you can read through it, it doesn't say, thou shalt not put up a flag, right? It doesn't say, thou shalt not put up a cross at the front of the church. It doesn't say, thou shalt not, you know, whatever, have some sort of object or image in your house or in your church. It doesn't say that. What it does appropriately do is it asks the question, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm involved in, whatever objects I may have, a flag or whatever, will it compromise my relationship with God? That's, it literally asks that question, will this compromise my relationship with God? And we need to ask ourselves that question as we go about our lives, and I think that's correct. It's the heart of the issue that matters. In fact, with this, any image, even a cross, the cross up here, or a dove, okay, can be an issue. Pastor Mike Winger states, you need to be very cautious. Idols are typically used to substitute a lack of relationship with the Lord. Any image is a mockery compared to God. So, so as you worship, as you worship God, if you begin to feel your worship directed at an object instead of God, who can't be compared to any image, you need to reset. Okay? We need to reset, realign yourself with who God is that his majesty doesn't compare to anything and direct your worship only to God, to him alone. That's the second one, no idols. The third command, Exodus 27, kind of a short one. You shall not take the Lord, sorry, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So in other words, we should not misuse God's name. Shouldn't misuse God's name. It really has to do with the misuse of power, right? Attributing things to God's name in order to coerce, control, gain power over people, or falsely attribute God's names to things that are not biblical. I mean, how many atrocities? There are admittedly many atrocities that have happened throughout history that have been attributed in God's name. You should not misuse it that way. I mean, just silly example, right? Hey, guess what, church? God just told me you should give me $10,000, right? Misuse. He didn't tell me that. Um, misusing it for power, for control. But it's also, it could also be that it's wrong to use his name disrespectfully, this is why Jews, because there, there actually is no command that says, you know, don't speak my name. You know, God saying, don't speak my name. There's no command that says, says that, but Jews historically, and even today, Orthodox Jews, refuse to use or pronounce God's name at all because of this commandment, because of their fear of misusing it. They won't speak God's name um, unless they are praying or reading from the Torah, even to this day, because they have a respect for it. Now, I, just for clarification, again, 
getting to the heart of the law, I don't, I would not say that misusing God's name disrespectfully, well, I would say it's more of an accountability issue, I think, between fellow Christians, okay? I, people outside the church may not have the knowledge yet of how holy God is and how we are to revere him and respect him in every way. Um, I think it's more of a process of a, a, a bigger process within the sanctification process that goes on when you become a Christian, okay? Again, staying away from the legalistic side of it, but it's what's at the heart of the matter. So the, the third one, don't misuse God's name. The fourth commandment, Exodus 20, this is 8 through 11. This is the last one going through today. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughters, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Christy and I were talking about this one, and she said I was really good at this one. I didn't know how to take that. Uh, Either I was lazy, or I am lazy, or I don't know. Anyways, the Sabbath day, right? So, so it was supposed to be on the seventh day, on the seventh day of the week, so it'd be like Saturday. Um, you weren't supposed to work, and you weren't supposed to make anybody else work, right? Not, not your cattle, not the sojourner. The sojourner is somebody that is not necessarily a Jew. It's somebody traveling, maybe uh, coming into their territory. Just, it's like, in the U.S., if we were to have somebody, we have people come over to the U.S. all the time, they maybe have to follow our laws while they're here, but we're not assimilating them into our culture, and they're going back, you know, they're leaving, right? These sojourners were not there to become Jewish, right? But they couldn't even make them work. Couldn't make anybody work. And it was supposed to be holy, which is you were, you're supposed to worship on that day and corporately worship on that day. And it goes, again, right back to Genesis and creation where God works six days, rests on the seventh, and some people say he's still resting. How many of you follow all of these? And maybe there are probably some Christians that do. Like to the T, right? You do it on Saturday, the seventh day. You don't make anybody else work, right? You don't go to any restaurants or whatever. Like, how many of us follow it to a T? So the question really is like, okay, should, as Christians, should we keep the Sabbath in this exact way? Right? Point by point by point. So, quickly, no, I, I don't think we're mandated to follow the Sabbath in this way. Right? I think we need, again, to get at the heart of the law. Paul, in Colossians 2, 16 through 17, says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food, specifically food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Let no one pass judgment on you for how you handle the Sabbath. And he goes on and he says, he explains this, he says, These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. All right, these these laws, they're a shadow, especially the Sabbath, are of things to come, and they're fulfilled in Christ. Jesus talks about how he is Lord of the Sabbath in Matthew. Jesus, many people say that Jesus is our Sabbath rest, right? He says, come to me. All who are weary, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. Jesus will give us rest. Hebrews makes the argument in chapter 4 
that the rest that Christians are waiting for in the end, do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody? The rest that we're waiting for when Christ returns a second time, we actually get a glimpse of that now in Christ. It makes that argument in four. What matters is the heart of the law, right? Which is to rest with God. Which is, and I honestly don't believe it matters what day. Christians, Christians, right in Acts, you can tell there's a shift, right? To worshiping on the Lord's day. The Lord's day is the day that Jesus rose. That's why we get together on Sunday. Historically, that's why we did it. I don't think it matters what day, but I believe God does desire to have a relationship with us. And I think it would be wise, it would be wise to set aside a day every week to worship God, to grow in your relationship with God, to depend on God. We are creatures of habit, and you can see that throughout history. And we can really easily, by the work that we do, the the things that we get involved in in our lives, can forget about God real easily. It's super easy. So I think it would be wise, again, not making it legalistic, but it would be wise to set aside time for God to grow in that relationship. So these four commandments, God's the only God. That's it. We shall have no other gods before us. God is holy both in his nature so that man-made things cannot compare and in name and shares worship with no one and no object. God desires relationship with us for our benefit. For our benefit. Ten Commandments. Paul does this in Romans. He goes, he goes, why the law? Like, what's the purpose here? What's the purpose of the law? One of the main purposes, because there are several purposes, okay? I'm just going to go through like one of them. One of the main purpose of the law is actually to point out sin, to point out our sin, to p- prepare our hearts for Christ, to show us that we can't live up to this list, right? But we need a Savior. We need a Messiah. It's one of the purposes. Romans, Paul in Romans 3, 19 through 20, he states, Now we know that whatever the law says, speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. We are accountable, all of us. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Saying, look, You can try and save yourself through this, but you can't. You can't live up to it. And so what it does is it gives us knowledge of our own sin. Uh, My family was eating supper one night. And uh, we were talking about this, this this topic. You know, hey kids, uh, the the law in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, what it does, you know, is it points out our sin and our need for a Savior. It points us to Christ. And um, I asked the question, I said, hey, uh, to my kids, uh, do any of you think that you've ever broken one of the Ten Commandments? And, and Beckett's like, no, I, I haven't. And uh, I'm like, oh, really? Like, so you've, you've always honored your father and mother? And he's like, you can see him kind of, you know, he's sulked down. He's like, okay, no, I, yeah, yeah, I know. Of course, Christy had to interject Hey, kids, you ever see your dad sin? <laughs> Beckett jumped on that opportunity <laughs> fast as he could. He said, oh, yeah, when he cusses. And I'm like sitting there like, what in the world are you talking about? Like, what? And uh, Eloise, Eloise, bless her heart. She was like, what does cussing mean? And Christy responded, it, it, it means, you know, like when you say bad words. And her eyebrows went up like in big shock, like, oh yeah, he does that a lot. 
I'm like, give me a break here. And I'm like, what is going on? And she goes, yeah, dad, like when you and mom get in these long conversations, you use, you say stupid a lot. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that makes a little more sense. So if you want to know where your sin is, you can not only look to the law, you can look to your children. But the law points out our sin. And if you're, ever really, if you're feeling really good about yourself someday, and I don't mean like, hey, I'm having a good day. That's great. And God wants to pour out blessings on us that we are happy and joyful. That's fine. But I'm saying pridefully, if you're have, ever having a pridefully good day, going, you know, I'm just a really good person. Just go ahead and pull the Ten Commandments out and look at it. Right? How many of you, as you look at the list, have ever broken a commandment. I have. I have. And, and it, it gets even worse than this list because Jesus comes along and he decides to teach us what's at the heart of God's law. And he says in Matthew, right, at the heart of committing adultery is if you lust after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. He says, at the heart of you shall not murder is being angry with your brother. And if you're angry with your brother, you're liable to judgment. And then I look at the list and I go, I've coveted. I've lied. I've stolen. I've committed adultery in my heart. I've murdered in my heart. I've disobeyed my parents. I've not kept the Sabbath. I've misused the Lord's name. I've had idols in my life. I've placed myself above God. And that, you know, that makes me a sinner, right? It makes me a liar, a thief, an adulterer, a murderer, and many other things. And like Paul, right, I I look at this list and I desire to do this. I desire to follow God's law. I want to do it. I try to do it. I want to do right by God, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. And actually my flesh and sin that dwells in me wages war against these commandments. And Paul in Romans gets to the same place in his argument as he's making his argument and he's in complete despair because there's no escape from the cycle of sin And he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 8, 1 through 2, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So it is through Christ where we find hope, where we find salvation. So historically, God has seen his creation through this lens and we all stand condemned through this lens. But now, through the lens of the new covenant, God sees us through Jesus. Paul says in Romans 8.34, Who is condemned? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? At this moment, Jesus sits at the right hand of God, interceding for us. So that his blood covers a multitude of sins. God sees us through Jesus, the perfect fulfillment of the law and prophets, Jesus, God's one and only Son, and He's there now interceding for us on our behalf 
So on the new covenant through Christ, Paul says, we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. We're under Jesus. We're under Christ. So, then Paul asks a good question. All right, does this mean that we should sin and let grace abound? Right? It's like, don't stop there. You know, don't stop at grace. Yeah, we've got Jesus. And that is a beautiful thing. And that's the good news of the gospel. And we can be joyous in that. Does this mean that the moral law of God does not exist? Or because we have grace, we can just go on sinning? And he's like, no, when we come to Christ, we die to sin. When we come to Christ, we die to sin. We become a new creation that desires to serve and follow God. And through the Spirit, we have help. Through the Spirit, we can accomplish this. Not by our own means, through the Spirit. So as Christians, we should approach the law differently. So we no longer approach it externally, right? Externally, like they were written on stone tablets. It was an external law that you looked to. Let me go back to it. It was an external law that you looked to and compared your behavior to. We're no longer to approach it that way. And we don't approach it legalistically, right? The Israelites did a couple things wrong. They, well, they did more than a couple things, but let me just point out two. They not only broke God's law over and over and over and over again, right? But they eventually made it legalistic in the sense, let me give you the Sabbath, right? They took the Sabbath, the Pharisees, they took the Sabbath and don't work on that day and they started making a list of their own thing. A list of things, I think there's like 60 some things on the list or more, something like that, of, of things that you cannot do on the Sabbath. Beyond thou shalt not work and what's in the list, they took it and said, thou shalt not make bread. Specifically, thou shalt not blah, 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 like on and on. They made it legalistic. For Christians, it's not a list that you have to pull out every day and check off things. Ah, I didn't commit murder today. Check that off the list. It moved from the external law to an internal matter of the heart. An internal matter of the heart. And this is what was prophesied in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, I think two times in Ezekiel. They knew this. They knew this. (laughs) Israel knew this. They knew all this stuff was coming. Where in the new covenant, the law would be written on our hearts so that through the Spirit of God, following the law of God, just bubbles out of us. It's no longer outside of us, it's in us. And so we just, through God's Holy Spirit and help, it just comes right on out of us. Just a quick example of what I'm talking about. Has, have you ever seen your child, or maybe, maybe you yourself when you were a kid, You ever do something for your parents, not because somebody, not because one of them told you to do it, right? Not because you were coerced into doing something, not because it was a part of a repetitive uh, behavior or something. You just did it because you loved the person that takes care of you. Have you ever done anything like that? Our family loves Chick fil A. Right? And we love the waffle fries. Christy won't order the waffle fries. But what she does like is, you know, when after, typically in the box of fries, right, after you get through all the good fries, there's usually fry crumbs left in the bottom. Christy loves the fry crumbs. And she'll go around and ask us every once in a while, like, hey, you got any of those little crumbs left over? And um, Beckett caught on to this. Beckett caught on to this. And without coercion, 
without any sort of command from his parents, without any like repetitive installment of some behavior that he, we want him to fulfill, right? He just all the time goes up to his mother and says, hey, you want my crumbs? It's beautiful. I mean, it's like pure love for his parent. I mean, really, I know it doesn't really compare an example, right? But I mean, it brings tears to my eyes, the crumbs of fries. <laughs> yeah, right? Wow. But in a similar way, in a similar way, we are called to love God. That by grace through faith in Christ, which is salvation, by the help of the Spirit, we would love God and love others. Not because it's a command, not because we have to, but because we want to. And this is where it comes full circle. I'm going to wrap it up here. This is where it comes full circle because what does the Bible tell us how we are to love God in the new covenant? John tells us, 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So we show love to God by following his commandments. And it's because we love God that we follow his commandments. And I'll, I'll end with this. When you look at the Ten Commandments, right, you can split them up into two groups. And here they are split up into the two groups. The first four have to do with what? God. This is God telling us, this is how you love me. This is how you love me. And the second group is, this is how you love each other. This is how you love your neighbor. They knew this in the Old Testament, and that's why Jesus quotes it. And I'm going to end with this, right? And he, Jesus sums up the heart of the law and the prophets in this way. In Matthew 22, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Amen?